Hey guys, um, I've been going back and forth in my head for a while now with whether or not I should make this video, uh, but ultimately I feel like God is uh, tugging at my heartstrings to uh, put my testimony out to you guys in the hopes that if someone out there is struggling with an addiction, um, that they can watch my testimony and ultimately find hope um, that there's a better way a, uh, a, b a better way of living. Um, so I was born in 1985. Uh, I was healthy for about the first three days of being alive. And uh, I came down with uh, this thing called RSV. It's a viral uh, infection, I guess. And uh, back in 1985, uh, the mortality rate for RSV was a lot higher than it is today. And uh, um, actually, I think a, a majority of the babies that that contracted RSV in 1985, I think a majority of them ended up dying. Um, and uh, so anyway, I was uh, put in a medically induced coma by the doctors. Um, I was on a morphine drip. Um, you know, uh, actually, my mom tells a story of the doctor coming to her, you know, and, and telling her that... Um, that he had done all that he could do and the rest was in God's hands. And uh, that was back when doctors could say that and not end up facing a lawsuit for saying something like that. Um, but two weeks into being alive, uh, I, I came out of it okay. Um, you know, the problem was is that I, I just escaped death the first time and uh, I was already uh, withdrawing from drugs the first time. So, um, this seems to be um, this se seems to be a common theme in my life. Um, so anyway, uh, fast forward. Um, I, I grew up in church. Uh, my mom was a you know is a God fearing woman. She instilled morals and values into me that I am grateful for to this day. Um, you know, my dad was a and still is a very hard worker. Um, didn't have an exceptional childhood, you know, but it was it was good. Um, you know, my parents provided and we had everything that we needed. Um, it wasn't always perfect, but, um, you know, it was perfect to me. Um, so growing up, I've always felt this, um, this war waging inside of me. I don't know if anyone out there can relate, but this war waging inside of me um, of good versus evil. Um, you know, when I was young, my mom would share stories of, uh, you know, Jesus and, um, you know, Satan. And, you know, uh, I was told you, you have to be good or you'll go to hell. Uh, you, you know, that sort of stuff, that, that type of childhood. Um, and I was intrigued by this, you know, I'm like, you know, there's, there's more than meets the eye like what what is what is this what is this hell place you know so i found out that the devil's number was 666 and this was back uh when we had rotary dial phones you know it's those phones that you take your finger and you you know so um i ended up uh you know i wanted to call my mom's bluff so i dialed 666 on the rotary dial phone thinking that you know satan was going to answer on the other line and obviously he didn't, but that just kind of tells you the the mindset that I was in when I was a kid. I was kind of a weird kid. Um, also, I had this um, magic eight ball. And I remember, you know, there's like magic eight balls that you shake up and you ask it questions and it says yes or no or whatever. And um, I, I don't know why, but this moment like still just sticks out in my mind so clearly. I remember... Uh, really contemplating whether or not I was going to go to hell. And I shook this magic eight ball and I asked it if I was going to go to hell. And uh, I remember it said, it is decidedly so. And that really freaked me out. Um, I remember like being really distraught about this because I thought it was magic. I thought it knew, you know. Um, so I really kind of... Uh, grab church by the horns, if you will. I don't know if that's the right way to, to put it. I, I think that's kind of a contradiction. But anyway, um, so I, I went to church. Um, I would be in the church plays. 
Uh, I would, um, you know, sing songs. I loved to sing. I was in choir. Um, I remember there was a song that I used to sing when I was a kid, and the song uh, was called He's Still Working on Me. And, um, you know, I think that that, stall, that that song is like really relevant in my life to this day because God really is still working on me. Um, I'm so far from being perfect that it's not funny. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just very grateful that God is still working on me and, and, and continuing to help me grow every day to be a better man. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, fast forward to um, my teenage years. Um, you know, I was always intrigued by, or you know what, actually back up a little bit. So, um, no. No, we'll, 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 we'll go to the teenage years. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm kind of jumping around here, guys. Um, I was always intrigued by, uh, rock stars. Like I said, I love singing. Uh, I'm a, was a singer songwriter. Um, I really enjoyed bands like, uh, Limp Biscuit and, uh, Stained and like all this kind of like new Rocky stuff or whatever. And, um, I remember just idolizing like those type of people like Fred Durst and Aaron Lewis and um, I really wanted to grow up to be like them. You know, I, I would watch their music videos on MTV and stuff like this. And um, I was just really fascinated by that, like sex, drugs and rock and roll lifestyle. Um, just from from being a young kid, you know, I feel like the devil, uh, Satan was always enticing me uh, to, um, you know, to live on the edge a little bit. It was just kind of ingrained into me from a young age. Um, but anyway, uh, I still continue to go to church. Um, really what kind of set me off, uh, the deep end was, um, I had a few deaths that happened, um, in my, uh, earlier years. Uh, my grandma, who I loved dearly, um, she was, she was a rock in my life. Um, she was one of the most godly wom woman, women women, woman. She was one of the most godly women that I've ever known, uh, next to my mom. And, uh, when I was, when I was young, um, you know, she would pray for us and, uh, you know, she would tell me that I was her little prayer warrior and she would cut these little, uh, cloths, these little, little red cloths and pray over them and, and give them to me to, you know, put in my pocket. And she would say they would protect me because they were prayed over and, you know, God's going to be watching over me. Well, she ended up passing away and uh, I'm blessed with a very big family. Um, it's a blessing and a curse because there's a lot of love there, but there's also a lot of deaths. Um, when you have a big family, you go through a lot of death. And, um, you know, my grandma passed away. Um, I had a really good friend of mine um, named Chris who passed away in a car accident. Uh, and I remember, uh, one day I got a phone call and, uh, I heard that I had a, uh, I have a cousin named Alex. Um, I heard that he had gotten in a car accident and, um, you know, I, that, that was all they knew at that time, you know, Hey, your cousin Alex was in a car accident. We'll, we'll update you when we get more information. And I remember when I got that phone call, um, I just got down on my knees and I started praying. I said, God, you know, please, um, you know, watch over Alex. I, I hope that he's okay. God, I, I, I pray that, you know, everything's okay with him. And, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, I found out that he, he was in a car accident with eight people. Um, there were four people in each car, two cars collided with each other. Um, and he was the only one who passed away in the car. And I don't know what it was, it was, I think it was because I'd lost, you know, my friend and my grandma and, you know, I'd prayed that my, my cousin Alex would be okay after getting in this car accident. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I, I started to resent God, you know, it was like, you know, I prayed for this. Um, I believed in prayer up to that point. Um, you know, my prayer was a little late because he had already passed away before I'd even received the phone call. But in my mind, um, you know, God wasn't hearing my prayers, you know, and um, I, you know, like I said, I kind of fell off the deep end. Um, 
I started getting into smoking pot, um, drinking beer, you know, sneaking behind my parents' back, like sneaking out of the house. Um, you know, fast forward to, um, you know, my later teenage years, I was, uh, you know, stealing my mom's van um, when she would go to sleep at night and going out and drinking and driving and, um, you know, just being crazy. I remember there was this game we used to play where um, we would get on the highway and we would chug beers. And while we were chugging the beers, we would close our eyes and floor the car. And uh, we couldn't look at the road until we got done chugging the beer. So uh, <laughs> needless to say, I'm, I'm lucky to be alive. It's not funny. It's really not funny. But um, and again, I idolize these rock stars and stuff. So um, I had this I, I feel like I had a chip on my shoulder. I feel like I had something to prove. Like I always had this mentality like I want to be the craziest guy in the room. I want to be the most wild like I just I, th I just wanted people's respect. I wanted people to like me. And I thought that being the craziest, uh, you know, uh, just most insane person in the room uh, would, would get people to like me. Um, so anyway, um, fast forward a little bit. I end up, uh, um, you know, dropping out of high school um, I ended, I did get my GED. Like I said, my dad was a really hard working man. He still is. And, uh, he made me get my GED. Um, I ended up getting my GED, but I was pretty much going nowhere in life. Um, I ended up moving out of my parents' house and I moved into a party house with three of my friends. And that's where the real trouble began. Um, so I remember, uh, moving into this house and one of my friends, uh, we did a cheers the night that we moved in. And uh, he said, here's to all of us becoming alcoholics before we leave this place. And we all cheers like, yeah, you know. And uh, little did I know how accurately um, that was uh, predicting my future. So, um, you know, living in this house, um, I was a womanizer. Uh, we had girls over all the time. There would be girls bringing friends. And, um, you know, I, I just had this 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 hole in my heart, this, this, this void that I, you know, I can't even describe it, but I just had this void in my heart and I felt like filling it with, you know, girls and, um, smoking weed and drinking and, uh, doing these sorts of things, you know, going out and getting into fights and, you know, that sort of stuff. I, I, I felt like that that would fulfill me. Um, but it never did, you know, um, I eventually got into cocaine, um, kind of went off the rails on coke for a while. Um, you know, I, I developed a habit for it. Um, I started selling it. Um, while selling it, um, I... I don't want to go too deep into this. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that I'm not, uh, proud of while doing it. Um, but you know, I guess it made me who I am today. Um, but anyway, uh, was doing cocaine a lot and, uh, I had, I had some friends that would do heroin, but I knew that that was like that was a little too far for me. Um, I could do cocaine and, and feel like I could live with myself, but heroin was a different story. Um, well, anyway, uh, you know, just off the rails. Um, one night we were all doing cocaine and, um, I remember I, I got into pills and stuff like that too. But, uh, when I would do cocaine, I would, um, have Xanax uh, if you don't know what Xanax is, it's a, an anti-anxiety, yeah, it's an anti-anxiety medication. It pretty much puts you to sleep. Um, and I would, you know, I hated the come down feeling off of cocaine. If you do cocaine for, you know, long periods of time, um, to come down off of it, you know, I would, I would take Xanax and drink alcohol, that sort of stuff. But anyway, one night, um, I had a Xanax, uh, you know, we were doing a, a bunch of cocaine 
And uh, at the end of the night, um, I couldn't find my Xanax anywhere and I started having a panic attack and uh, I was really kind of in a bad way. And one of my buddies that did heroin, um, you know, he offered me like a little booger sized uh, portion of heroin. He's like, look, man, I know you don't do this. Um, you know, one little, one little booger sized thing isn't gonna, isn't gonna kill you. You know, this was back before there was a bunch of fentanyl in it and that sort of stuff. So um, I ended up doing a little, little tiny bit. And I just remember, um, you know, feeling the worst I've ever felt in my life, uh, just having a panic attack to taking a little hit of that heroin and it just instantly making me feel like a million dollars. Like I had finally arrived. Um, I felt like God, um, there's just no way to describe it. Uh, I don't want to glorify that feeling, but I just kind of want to let you know how I got to the point that I, that I ultimately ended up at. Um, uh, I really enjoyed it. The next day I woke up, the first thing I wanted to do was go get more. Um, and then it was off to the races from there. Um, I ended up going to rehab like three or four times, I want to say. And, um, I remember, this is the hard part. So, um, I was snorting heroin for the longest time. Um, I was doing so much at one point that I'd completely, um, like destroyed my nasal cavity to the point to where when I was trying to snort it up, um, it would just fall out of my nose. And at that time I had so-called friends, um, that were shooting heroin up and, um, they were spending half as much money as me to get high and getting twice as high. Um, so in that moment, it just made sense for me to start, um, doing IV drug use. Um, so I started shooting up heroin. Um, from there it gets really, really blurry, but, um, I pretty much sold my soul for a high. Um, all the morals and all the values that I had attained from my childhood went out the window. Um, I would stab you in the back if you were my own brother, which I pretty much did. Um, I maxed out my dad's bank account or his credit cards. I, I wrote, you know, I stole my dad's checkbook. I wrote bad checks. Um, I had good friends who, uh, you know, one of the worst things I ever did was I had a friend whose mom let me live with them because I was out um, you know, on my, on my luck, um, cause I was a drug addict and my friend's mom let me stay there. She looked at me as if I was her own son. And I went into her room because I was withdrawing one day and I stole three rings out of her bedroom. They were gold rings. Um, I took them to the pawn shop. I pawned them. I went out and I got high. And um, I found out later that one of the rings was her dead husband's and two of the rings were um, her dead dad's. So um, that was a really, really tough pill to swallow. That's probably one of the worst things that I've done. Um, you know, that, that to this day still haunts me. Um, you know, but anyway, um, I, um, I was pretty much off the rails. Um, I remember one time before, uh, my parents sent me to rehab. Uh, I remember my dad finding out that it was like $6,000 to send me to rehab. And, um, I remember my dad saying, I don't have $6,000 to send you to rehab. And I remember my mom saying to him, you can spend $6,000 to put him in rehab, or you can spend $6,000 to put him in the ground. It's up to you what you want to do. And, um, you know, being the great parents that they were, they put me in rehab and, 
uh, being the horrible human being I was at that time, as soon as I got out, I got high again. Um, you know, there were a few moments in my life where, uh, you know, just to touch on them quickly, um, one time I ended up getting jumped by like uh, six or seven guys and I picked up a claw hammer and stuck it into the side of a guy's head. Um, I've had, uh, I've been shot at. Um, I've been in bar fights that involved 50 people um, and ran out of the bar being chased by a bunch of people getting ripped out of the back of a truck. Um, uh, you know, I've been through it, you know. Um, you know, just countless uh, trips to jail, um, you know, uh, but the, the, main, the main story that I really wanted to get to was this, guys. Um, I overdosed on heroin, um, but what's crazy was, is I had never thought, I, I had never thought about overdosing before, and something about this day, I was with a friend, or a so-called friend, um, we were going to score some dope, um, and we were talking about what we would do if either of us overdosed for some reason. I'd never spoken to this guy about what we would do if the other one overdosed. Never, never even crossed my mind, as crazy as that sounds. Um, but we had just talked about it that morning on the way to go get drugs. And um, what's crazy is th this whole day had divine intervention written all over it. But anyway, um, I end up uh, scoring the drugs. I was driving. Um, I was driving. And uh, while I was driving, um, I'm really not proud to say this, but I stuck my arm out and uh, my friend mixed up uh, a shot of heroin and he put it in my arm. And while I was driving, um, I ended up overdosing behind the wheel. Um, he, had a, he had a way bigger tolerance for it than I did. And he mixed up one that he could handle and not me. And uh, I ended up falling out behind the wheel. Uh, I'm driving, I'm going down the road. Um, the way he describes this story is he has no clue how we stopped. Um, we are on a road heading towards, we're on, it's, we're on a main road. We're heading towards another main road and there is a red light and we're going about 30 miles an hour. I literally am completely out. Uh, we're heading towards this red light and he says somehow, by the grace of God, we end up sideswiping a tree, coming up over a curb and we, he said the car just stopped right before we went through this red light and um, he was able to get the car in park. I am passed out behind the wheel. Um, he calls 911. Uh, they tell him to pull me out of the truck and start giving me uh, mouth to mouth resuscitation. Um, he checks my pulse. There's nothing there. Uh, it ends up taking about 10 minutes before the paramedics got there. Um, and the whole time he's, you know, giving me mouth to mouth. Uh, but anyway, um, while I was out, I don't know how to describe this other than when I went out, um, I experienced something supernatural that day. Um, the only way I can describe it is um, I met my guardian angel. I was wrapped in the most warm, most beautiful white light that I could ever describe to you. And while I was laying on the ground in the middle of a busy intersection dying, I had a conversation with what I can only describe as my guardian angel. Um, and the, the, the sad part about this is, is I remembered what her and I had talked about like when I, when I finally ended up waking up, I remembered what her and I had talked about and I remember it being so profound. But as, as I came back to reality, I forgot. So um, I cannot tell you 
what this guardian angel and I talked about, but what I can tell you is that it was real. Um, it was a real experience. Um, and what's really crazy is when my buddy pulled me out of, it was, oh, uh, I forgot to mention that it was my dad's truck. Okay. So I asked to borrow my dad's truck that day. Um, I told him that I had to go pick up some furniture. Um, he reluctantly allowed me to use his truck, you know, under the guise that I, that I would be back very soon. And I end up going and scoring drugs and getting high and I end up wrecking his truck. But anyway, um, when I was laying on the concrete and the paramedics were doing CPR to bring me back, they hit me with this shot of something called Narcan to, to bring me back to life. And I remember like, as I was talking to this lady in my dream, I remember just getting sucked out of this conversation. And I remember wanting to go back so badly. But when I came to, the driver's side door of my dad's truck was open and all I could do was focus on this thing on the visor of my dad's truck. And as I'm staring up at my dad's truck visor and I come back to reality, you know, I've got the paramedics saying, stay with me, stay with me. And, I, and I'm, I'm hearing in my head and I'm thinking that it's this, this angel saying, stay with me, stay with me. And guys, I just wanna show you, um, I keep it in my truck now because it's, it's very important to me. But this, that right there was what I was staring at when I came back to reality, it was uh, a little thing that says angels watching over me. <laughs> so I come to and I'm staring at this thing that says angels watching over me. And uh, I end up getting taken to the hospital. They took me in uh, an ambulance or whatever. And uh, I guess when the cops were kind of combing through my dad's truck, um, there was a sign, my sister, she at the time was probably like 18, but she has like really horrible handwriting. And my sister had written a note, uh, to my, to my dad. And it said, I love you daddy on this note. But my sister's handwriting so horrible, uh, that it looked like a freaking first grader wrote it. Sorry, sis. Um, but anyway, uh, the cops go through the truck. This cop sees this sign that says, I love you, daddy. And he's like, you know what? He's like, uh, I, I need to go talk to this guy in the hospital, you know? So this cop, um, completely out of character for him because he had done many overdoses because I live in Ohio and it's like the overdose capital of the freaking world. Um, but anyway, he comes to the hospital to visit me. And while I'm in the hospital, he says, hey, um, you know, I was going through your truck and I saw that sign that says, I love you, daddy. And he didn't ask me if I had any kids, which I didn't. Um, but he said, you know, you need to be there for your kids no matter what. He said, you need to bite this thing in the butt and you need to go get clean, go get sober, and you need to be there for your kids. They deserve to have a good dad. And in my mind, I'm cocky, I'm arrogant, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you stupid pig, like I don't, <laughs> and I have respect for cops now, but at the time I had zero respect for police officers. Um, you know, I said to myself, you know, uh, I, I really, what the reason I didn't tell him that it wasn't my truck was because I didn't realize that it, the truck had already been towed. So um, I just didn't want my dad's truck to get towed. So I didn't say, hey, I don't have any kids, you're stupid. You know, um, I just was like, yeah, yeah, I know, whatever, blah, 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 get out of my face, whatever. Um, so he leaves, um, you know, even though I had had that experience, that supernatural experience with the whole guardian angel and seeing that thing on my dad's visor, uh, it wasn't enough for me. You know, um, I, here I am facing death, staring death in the eyes, almost dying. And I end up going back out and getting high again. Um, and this time, uh, this was literally the next time I went out and got high, I overdosed again. Um, I went behind my parents' house. It was the middle of winter. I, I overdose. Um, I fall into the snow and I laid there for two hours, shivering, laying in the snow. 
And I found out later that the only reason why I lived from that overdose was because I was laying in the snow, shivering, and the shivering kept my body moving enough to keep my heart beating. And um, that still wasn't enough for me to stop getting high. So at this point, my parents are ready to disown me. They had been ready to disown me for a while. Um, none of my friends wanted to talk to me anymore. Um, you know, I'd burned every bridge possible. Um, at this point, I'm thinking that it's probably better that I die because it's just so hard to keep it up. It's just so hard to wake up every day sick and alone. And uh, not to mention, um, I had just started dating a girl and what's crazy was is um, she didn't know that I was on heroin. Um, so her and I had been together like a couple of months and I'm like very sneaky. Um, and I was hiding the fact that uh, I was doing heroin for the first couple of months. And um, you know, my parents actually thought I had gotten clean, but I hadn't. And um, when she found out uh, that I was doing heroin, um, she did everything she could to help me, but she was getting really tired of, of dealing with me, um, lying to her and, and doing this sort of stuff. And, and, um, she was, she was ready to walk away. Um, but God had other plans. Um, so even after I'd overdosed twice, even after I'd burned all my bridges, my parents didn't trust me. I'd been to rehab. I was thousands of dollars in debt uh, due to legal fees and this sort of thing. And um, then I heard the craziest news I'd ever heard in my life. That girlfriend that I was with, who's now my wife, um, told me that she was pregnant. And when she told me that she was pregnant, the first thing that popped into my head was what that cop told me in the hospital that day. that you need to be there for your kids. No matter what. So, I thought about what that cop said and um, I thought about the angel watching over me. And I forgot to mention that um, when I got in the OVI, which is an operating the vehicle while intoxicated, it's the same as a DUI. When I got in that wreck, um, I got put on probation and um, I had to go in for random drug tests. Like I had to go in for, or not a random, but I had to go in for drug tests like once a week or whatever. And I was on this program where I had to go to these counseling classes and this sort of thing. So I'm faced with two options. I either have to go to jail, which I don't want to do and just serve my time. Or I can, um, you know, stay on the right path, um, stop doing drugs, pass my drug tests, and try to be a good dad. Um, it was, it was a no-brainer for me. Um, I, I got this fire in me because I had a reason to live. Like my, my, me finding out that I was going to be a dad was everything that I needed in order for me to pick myself up off the ground and, and, and fight for my life. Um, you know, God, God's plan is perfect. Um, you know, I have, I have seen what the bottom looks like. I have hit rock bottom and I'm so thankful that that rock was Jesus Christ. I am so thankful. Um, you know, God put a kid in my life when I needed it the most, he knew exactly what I needed to, to, to fight for my life because 
I wasn't worth it to me at that time. I wasn't worth it. Um, I needed a reason to live and God gave me that reason. Um, so, you know, fast forward to today. I'm five years sober. Um, I have three beautiful children. I have a beautiful wife. I'm a born again believer in Jesus Christ. I run my own business. I own my own home. Um, I say these things not to boast because, you know, the material side of things, homes and cars and businesses and all that stuff, it is a temporal, temporal, temporal things. Okay, material does not matter. Family is everything. And Jesus Christ is everything. And, um, you know, if you're out there and you're struggling with addiction, there is hope. There is, there is hope. Find a rehab, check yourself in, and find a reason to live. Pray to Jesus Christ. You know, hear the gospel. Um, just don't give up. Like, I wanted to give up so bad for so long. And something inside of me just kept telling me to fight. When I would find myself in situations like rehab and jail, I would look around and I would just hear this voice in my head. And looking back, it was God. And it, would, it was just saying like, this is not you. You do not belong here. Like you are better than this. And, um, you know, going back to when my mom dedicated me to God, you know, God never failed me. You know, he never failed me. You know, this, this, my testimony has so much more to it than this, but you know, this is just like the, the small version. Um, but you know, guys, God is real. God is love. And I pray that somebody out there who needs this hears it. And I pray that they find Jesus Christ. And I pray that they find peace. And I pray that they can get off the drugs. Because there's a life out here that is so worth living. You just have to make the, you just have to take the steps necessary to get there. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye.